This is the first in a series of video lectures on linear algebra. The purpose of this first video is to define some important terminology that we'll be using throughout the course, and also to establish some easy examples to give you an idea of what the kind of things are that we're going to be talking about. So a big focus on linear algebra is the idea of a linear equation. And a linear equation is an equation that can be written in this form a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2, and so on, all the way through an times xn equals b. So the x1 and the x2 and so on, those are the variables. Now, very often we'll see these equations in terms of, you know, x, y, and z, and so on, but the subscripts are handy because it doesn't limit us to how many variables we can have. And in the real world, very often you end up with systems of equations where you have hundreds of variables, and so it's nice to not be limited to just the alphabet. So when you see these systems of equations, these x1, x2, and so on, those will actually be variables. But the a1, the a2, and so on, and the b, those will actually be numbers. And we'll see examples in just a second. But the a numbers are called the coefficients of the equation. So this is an example of a linear equation. In this case, the variables are called x, y, and z rather than x1, x2, and x3. But uh, the coefficients here are 2. And then we don't see a coefficient in front of the y, which means the coefficient is actually the number 1. The coefficient of z is actually negative 8. So even though it says minus 8z, the actual coefficient there is the negative 8. This is also a linear equation, although there are a couple things that I want to point out here. First of all, the coefficient of the x1 is negative 1, is that coefficient. We don't see an x2, so the coefficient of x2 is actually 0. So if ever a variable is missing, that means the coefficient of that variable is actually 0. The coefficient of x3 is pi, and it's okay to have non-rational or even non-integer coefficients. So pi is a real number, and so that is an acceptable coefficient for us to have in this linear equation. Similarly with the square root of 2, that's okay to have as a coefficient, and so a4 here, the fourth coefficient, is negative the square root of 2, and then of course decimals are also okay. So any kind of real number can be a coefficient in these linear equations. This is also a linear equation, although it's not in the standard form, but it can be put into that standard form. We can do that by adding 4x to both sides and subtracting 6 from both sides. When we do that, we get 6x minus y equals 7. And if we wanted to write this in the notation with the subscripts, we could also write this as 6x1 minus x2 equals 7. And so our coefficient a1 would be 6, and our coefficient a2 would be negative 1. Now this is, is an example where we do not have a linear equation, and there are several things wrong with this equation. First of all, we can't have the square root of a variable. So the variables have to appear just being multiplied by real number coefficients, not raised to any strange powers. We also aren't allowed to have variables being divided. So 1 divided by y, even though the 1 is a, is a real number, the y, we can't have that in the denominator. We're also not allowed to have variables multiplied by each other. So for the, it to be a linear equation, we have to have each variable appearing individually. So those are the things to watch out for if you're trying to figure out whether you have a linear equation or not. Right, now that we know what a linear equation is, what does it mean to find a solution to a linear equation? Well, all that means is that we have a value for each variable that makes the equation true. So in this case, we have this equation, x minus 4y minus 6z equals 17, and we're given an, a solution x equals 3, y equals 4, and z equals negative 5. So we can check this solution by plugging in those values in for our variables in our equation. So we put in a 3 for the x, a 4 for the y, and a negative 5 for the z, and we check does that really equal 17. So we get 3 minus 16 plus 30. 3 minus 16 is negative 13, plus 30 is indeed 17, and so that means this is a solution. Now that doesn't mean that it's the only solution. There may often, as we'll see down the road, there may be many solutions to these equations, but this is at least one of the solutions. Now, a system of linear equations is a collection of one or more linear equations that involve the same variables. So one linear equation by itself is technically considered a system of equations, although it's not very interesting. Typically, we'll be looking at systems of equations that have many equations.
So in this case, we have a system of two equations, and I've written it so that the variables line up, and we'll see that often. So there's where the x1s live, there's where the x2s live, and there's where the x3s live. And again, if the equations that you're given aren't already in that form, it's helpful to line them up and write them in that form to make the operations that you're going to use to solve the equations that much easier. So we talked about how a solution to one linear equation is a value for each variable that makes that equation true. So a solution to a system of linear equations is a value for each variable that makes all of the equations true all at the same time. Now I'm also going to introduce some notation here. We often write the solutions to these systems as ordered tuples, so S1, S2, and so on, surrounded by parentheses. So if you've never seen that word tuple before, it's a, it's a little bit of a weird math word, but we've seen the idea of an ordered pair, so 3, 4 is an ordered pair. But if I had something like negative 1, 0, 6, that's an ordered triple. And then something like 2, 4, negative 1, 8, that's an ordered quadruple, and so on. So an ordered n tuple, that just means a bunch of numbers separated by commas where there are n of those. So s1, s2, s3, all the way up through sn, that's just the generalization of this idea of an ordered pair. And it just gives us a convenient way to write these numbers. So the first number in the parentheses, that's the value for the first variable. The second number in the parentheses, that's the value for the second variable, and so on. So for example, looking back at the system that we looked at earlier, negative 3 comma negative 8 comma 4 is not a solution, and I'm going to show you why it's not a solution to this system. So remember that the way this works is that this negative 3, that's the value that I want to plug in for x1, negative 8, that's the value I want to plug in for x2, 4, that's the value I want to plug in for x3. So I need to make all of these equations true, so we're going to start by checking the first equation, 2x1 minus x2 plus 1.5x3 equals 8. So when we plug in, we get 2 times negative 3 minus minus 8 plus 1.5 times 4. And again, the question is, does that equal 8? 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Minus minus 8 is plus 8. 1.5 times 4 is 6. And there it does turn out that 8 equals 8. But it's not enough for one of the equations to be true. All of the equations have to be true for these values, for these same values. So now I have to also check the second equation. And if there are more equations, I would have to check all of those. But now I'm going to plug in. I get negative 3 minus 4 times 4. Does that equal negative 7? That's negative 3 minus 16. But negative 3 minus 16 is negative 19. And that does not equal negative 7. And so that's why this is not a solution. It has to be a solution to all of the equations at the same time. So here we have something that is a solution. So again, the first number in the triple is the value of x1, the second number is the value of x2, the third number is the value of x3. But again, for us to check this, we've got to check all of the equations. So 2x1 minus x2 plus 1.5x3. Does that equal 8? Well, when we plug in, we get 2 times 5 minus 6.5 plus 1.5 times 3. 2 times 5 is 10, minus 6.5, 1.5 times 3 is 4.5, and that does in fact work out to be 8. But that doesn't tell us that this is a solution yet. We've got to check the second equation. So x1 minus 4x3 does that equal negative 7. x1 is 5, x3 is 3. That's 5 minus 12, and 5 minus 12 does in fact work out to be negative 7. So since these values make both of our equations true, that means that this is a solution to our system of equations. So going forward in the course, we're going to have these general questions. Given a system of linear equations, how can we tell whether that system has any solutions at all? If it does have solutions, is there one unique solution, or are there many solutions? And again, that word unique is a word that's used in a special way in mathematics. When we talk about there being one and only one of something, we use that word unique. So it's just to emphasize the fact that there is one solution and no other solutions. And that is, as we'll see, one of the possibilities. And then question number two is, if we can determine whether there are one or more solutions, how do we actually find those solutions? Again, imagine that we're in a situation where we have 
dozens of equations and dozens of variables, is there a systematic way that we can go through that and find any solutions to that system of equations? That's what we're going to be working on.